So um, my name is Simon Gain. Thank you very much for asking me to talk today. I am a consultant rhinologist at the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital. And um, as a declaration of my uh, possible conflicts, I do run a smell clinic. I don't get paid for it at the moment, so it's no real com uh, conflict there. And I am PI for a trial of one of the monoclonal antibodies, but I don't get paid for that either, so there's no conflict there. Uh, and my talk is about the role of surgery for olfactory dysfunction. Does it really work? So what have we learned so far? We've learned that I'm not very good at negotiating my uh, salary. And I'd like to also tell you about something that, um, <clears throat> sorry, one of my favorite forms of uh, internet ephemera, which is called Betridge's Law. And this will become apparent why this is, uh, this is important later. Betridge's Law was uh, coined by Ian Betridge, who's a journalist, and it says, uh, if you come across an article where the, uh, the title is phrased in the form of a question, the answer to that question is always no. So, uh, from The Guardian, would we be all, all be better off living with wolves? I think we know the answer there. No. What about the Mail Online? Is the Queen related to the Prophet Muhammad? The answer is no. And these are all very uh, English uh, headlines, but perhaps my f most English of all of these could a non-alcoholic gin ever be as good as a real thing? I don't think we have to answer that. Good, so being scientists, we have our own version of this as Hinchcliffe's rule or Hinchcliffe's law, uh, named after the physicist. Uh, and the reason we know that this exists is because of this fantastic paper, is Hinchcliffe's rule true? And the entirety of the paper is uh, displayed before you. In abstract, Hinchcliffe has asserted that whenever the title of a paper is a question with a yes, no answer, the answer is always no. This paper demonstrates that Hinchcliffe's assertion is false, but only if it is true. One of my favorite paradoxes there. <clears throat> so if we apply this to the title of my talk, uh, is there a role for surgery, uh, for surgery in olfactory, um, in the treatment of olfactory ants? The answer is no. But actually, the answer is yes, but sometimes. And the question is, what is that sometimes? When is olfactory, um, surgery important? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. The um, recent position paper has come out against the classification of conductive versus neural versus central causes uh, for olfactory loss. And I agree that this is not a good way of classifying diseases, but I would argue that it's an excellent way of classifying mechanisms. So different diseases can have multiple mechanisms of cause of, of hypo, hyposmia or olfactory loss. And what we're looking here, we're looking to treat this with surgery. What is surgery good at? It is good at changing anatomy. Medicines for physiology, I think, and surgery is for anatomy. So what we want is anatomical causes of smell loss. So where the mechanism, whatever your diagnosis might be, is a conductive smell loss. So what does this mean? Well, the canonical example is, of course, chronic rhinosinusitis with or without nasal polyposis. It's multi-mechanistic, but you can imagine that taking the polyps out of this poor gentleman's nose might improve his sense of smell because of access to the olfactory cleft. Uh, that's going to make a difference for lots of reasons, but probably, or hopefully, to the sense of smell. Um, and we know that, as I said, multi-mechanistic uh, causation of the smell loss in chronic rhinosinusitis. This is biopsy study of uh, the olfactory epithelium. Uh, the, on the, uh, the picture B on, the, on your left is a normosmic uh, volunteer, and this is the interface between the olfactory and respiratory epithelium. So respiratory epithelium there, and you can see this dense olfactory uh, epithelium on, on B, but on C, the, uh, the um, olfactory epithelium looks horrible. There's uh, distorted architecture, very poor nu um, neurological staining, and we also have biopsy studies showing that uh, there's uh, direct inf uh, infiltration with inflammatory cells and a direct neuromodulation of olfaction from the inflammation of a chronic rhinosinusitis with or without nasal polyposis. So how would you expect these people to get better with FEZ? I mean, as, uh, with functional endoscopic sinus surgery, we're changing the anatomy. Well, 
they do improve. We know this for anybody who's performed functional endoscopic sinus surgery on people with nasal polyposis will, will, will recognize the, the form of this chart. This is re a recent uh, study looking at Snifinix six scores before and after surgical intervention with and without chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, uh, with, with and without nasal polyposis. The nasal polyposis, as you might expect, is the lower uh, blue-green uh, blue curve, and without nasal polyposis, the slightly higher curve. And you can see exactly what we would expect. That there's improvement of their sniff and stick scores, but it kind of plateaus out after a while. And I would bet that for most of those patients, you follow them up for slightly longer, and they'll return to normal as the polyps re uh, uh, return. This study went on to look to classify the kind of outcome that you would expect looking at the initial presentation of smell dysfunction. So they classified them by internormosmic, hyposmic, and anosmic groups, and then looked at their function at two weeks after the surgery and again six weeks after the surgery. And as you might expect, the anosmics improved and then slightly trailed off when they were uh, at six months. But more interestingly, and this is something that Professor Lund used to say to me numerous times, look at the normosmic groups. It's possible to not to improve them, but it is possible to make them worse. And what I've left out here is the outliers, where those patients have been converted from hyposmic or normosmic into uh, almost anosmic patients. So it's possible to improve the sense of smell with your surgery. It's also possible to make it a lot worse. So why should FES work? I've just told you that taking the polyps out doesn't affect the, uh, the other uh, uh, causes of, of hyperfunction. Well, um, Harsha Kariwasam, the medical rhinologist I work with, calls nasal polyps immune factories. They're pumping out these inflammatory mediators. They're calling new cells in all the time. They're, they're driving their own formation and their own inflammation. Uh, over and over again. And so removing these immune factories not only allows access to the cleft, but also removes a lot of the ongoing immunological drive. And that's why we're seeing those uh, results that I showed you earlier. What do we know? What's the evidence for things that we can do while we're do, uh, performing this kind of surgery? Well, there's some evidence uh, for, this is a, a recent trial of a homemade dr drug eluting stent. Others, uh, there are now uh, commercially available drug eluting stents, and it does seem that placing a triamcinolone in a gel gelatin uh, dressing within the olfactory cleft uh, promotes the um, preservation or, or the recovery of olfactory function after functional endoscopic sinus surgery. What we know, you do it doesn't matter or doesn't seem to matter. It, it doesn't seem to matter, and this is quite surprising to me. There's evidence that if the middle turbinate needs to be resected, that doesn't seem to make any, a difference. And neither uh, does partial resection of the superior turbinate. Again, slightly counterintuitive, but this is the evidence. And what I don't know is whether or not addressing this, this is uh, Didier Trottier's first uh, description of the isolated olfactory cleft syndrome. You can see in the middle there, there's almost no other significant nasal disease apart from those conchibulosa, which are impacting on the, on the olfactory cleft. And what I don't know and I cannot find evidence for, and I, and I have a patient with this at the moment, we're debating whether or not it would be worth attempting lateralizing those middle turbinates to see whether that, whether that would improve things. Uh, what we do know is that isolated lesions within the cleft, that's well worth taking out, uh, whether they are, um, you can see there, the dotted lines are the full excision of rear and nasal polyps within the olfactory cleft, that's well worth taking out. You can expect a good improvement there. This is one of my cases, a lady presented with very, very isolated anterior uh, olfactory cleft lesions I was convinced was gonna be a respiratory epithelial uh, adenoma. Oh, that's not my talk at all. I, I, can't, I can't, yeah, I can't tell you about that one. Uh, a, a rear respiratory epithelial adenomatoid hamatoma. I was convinced this was gonna be it. We took it out. Unfortunately, it just turned out to be polyps but she still got uh, much better with uh, her polypoid um, resection. Uh, interestingly, she also had parosmia, which I struggled to explain. So 
in CRS, we know that uh, that treatment, that surgical treatment, does have a role in there. What about non-CRS anosmic patients? What's the role of, sur of structural surgery? Well, uh, you'll see this name uh, on the bottom. You may recognise before this is uh, some of Thomas's work, looking at a large group of patients who are undergoing sinus and septal surgery, uh, and you can see just on the uh, right, your right-hand side. The septum patients, small amount, there are about over 300 in this trial, about seven of them noticed a decrease in their, in their score, but a lot more, only amounting to uh, about 7% of the total though, improved in their or measured olfactory function after septal surgery. Uh, and that's all we know. They weren't randomized to this. This was just to see whether or not it made a difference. Uh, this is looking at spread of grafts within septal rhinoplasty. Again, there's some problems uh, with this as a, a Turkish group, um, but if you can see this is T, D, and I, and the first two values on each of those are the patients who received spread of grafts for another indication. They weren't randomized to receive or not, so we have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt, but it looks like spread of grafts and there is some imaging, uh, uh, sorry, some uh, computational work which uh, indicates that nasal valve uh, correction should also improve the sense of smell. So maybe we should be looking at that. So the question is how do you decide which of your patients is going to benefit from the surgery? Well, it rests on making the correct diagnosis. And the correct diagnosis is a combination at the moment of, of imaging, thank you, of good testing. Um, but what I'd really like to see is a pure tone audiogram for smell. Something that, um, that shows us, is this conductive, is this neural, is this central, something that we can see that gives us the answer without having to think too hard. That's what I'd like. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that, so we have to rely on the combination of clean, clinical acumen, imaging, and testing. Uh, and I will often, especially in the inflammatory disorders, try a course of uh, empirical therapy. I think if they respond to oral steroids, and that uh, indicates an eosinophilic or inflammatory uh, disease within the olfactory cleft, and that makes me much more likely to try and address that, uh, and using that as a test rather than, than a treatment. And then I'll go through with the patient what I expect the benefits to be, that we have a significant but not 100% chance of improving the sense of smell if, it, if uh, they choose to go ahead with the surgery that we're talking about. However, I do talk to them about the risks, and I think this is changing in, in uh, the coming years. Uh, certainly, you can imagine septoplasty. We all know what the risk of septoplasty is. I would have a fairly low threshold for performing one of those, if indicated by the imaging. But um, medializing a middle turbinate that's uh, arising from the skull base, well, that's not without some significant um, risk factors of CSF leak, uh, damage in the cribriform plate, etc. And so I think we're left with a weighing up of, uh, of uh, our surgical interventions as per usual. What I've noticed recently is that my uh, approach to functional endoscopic sinus surgery for CRS has become a lot less aggressive because I believe that in the next couple of years, our monoclonal uh, antibody therapies are going to radically change how we manage chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. And I'm aware that the old model of uh, improving sinus access for topical steroids might become slightly irrelevant, and we may be left with far more people with uh, empty nose type syndromes uh, when their polyps have disappeared because of their monoclonal antibodies. But I do uh, discuss this with my patients uh, before. So uh, that's my take on uh, surgery, both the evidence base and my, my current clinical practice. I'd like to leave you at the, at the end of it uh, with the, the reminder about Betridge's law or uh, Hinchcliffe's law, but we know that this doesn't uh, really apply to this because the answer is um, not the same. It's not no. So I'd like to maybe, with a great degree of false modesty, suggest Gaines law, which suggests that if you're attending a talk at ERS 2018 and the, uh, the title of the talk is uh, posed in the form of a question, then the answer is, does the role of surgery in olfactory dysfunction really work? Sometimes. Thank you. <laughs>